Well, thanks so much for the time. Oh, uh, my pleasure. Thank you. Let's talk about the session overall. Uh, walk me through the wins and, and also some things that, that didn't quite get there that you would like to see finished. Through. Sure. Well, let's start with the beginning of the session and how non-traditional it was. Before most sessions, legislators gather together and they start hammering out the details of legislation in advance uh, and start working together. Uh, and then they begin the early stages of that in January. This session was unlike any other in that because of COVID, they didn't have the meetings before session, during session, during January, they were not meeting. They didn't even begin to meet until the February timeframe. And so when you consider that context, and when you see all the things that were passed, it's a remarkable session. There were legacy-based issues that people have been clamoring for for a long time that finally got across the finish line. Things like constitutional carry, which is a big issue among uh, the Republican Party making sure that we keep our cities safe, which means addressing cities that try to defund police. We're, we're not going to allow in Texas the type of programs you see in Portland and Seattle and Michigan and, and New York and things like that. Uh, and so other things that we were able to accomplish on top of making sure that we balance the budget with a limited growth, limited to population growth plus inflation, when you consider all the things that were accomplished, it really is pretty amazing. With regard to pandemic response, uh, did the state tackle COVID-19 repercussions to your satisfaction? You mean in, through the legislative session? Yes, sir. Listen, there's always things that can be worked on uh, and always things uh, that can be added at some future date. And uh, there may be some issues that need to continue to be focused on because we want to make sure that there are uh, appropriate standards, whoever the governor is. And I support making sure we have the appropriate standards. And so uh, that's something that we can continue to work on to make sure that in the event that we ever have a pandemic again, uh, it, there will be certain guardrails in place to make sure that it is handled appropriately. Relating to the winter storm, did the state uh, legislature do enough to address the power grid? I want to make one thing clear to everybody. First, uh, it's horrific that anybody had to go through a winter storm like that. Uh, but it's so important for people to understand that as we come out of this session, the power grid is more secure, more robust, and safer than ever before. Let me take through just a couple items. One is accountability and transparency, both with the Public Utilities Commission uh, as well as with ERCOT. Second is weatherization. We don't call it winterization because we need the grid to work both in the summer and the winter. Uh, but with these uh, weatherization programs, man, it's gonna make sure that uh, locations that did shut down will not shut down. The next is enforcement. There are now enforcement mechanisms in place for those entities that do not weatherize. Another is capacity. As we sit here west today, Texas has more power generating capacity than we've had ever before. Uh, and then uh, you, you look at communication, that we now have new communication standards among ERCOT and the PUC, as well as across the entire state of Texas to make sure there will be early warnings sent to the general public to make sure they are aware of what's going to take place. Bottom line is uh, the power grid is stronger and better than ever before. We wanna make sure, that, first of all, we did get that across the finish line, but second, that the public knows about it. Is there more to do on the power grid in a special session? We will talk about that between now and the special session to see if there were any items that were missed. I, I do know from talking to legisl legislators, they are very pleased with the product they got across the finish line. As it relates to uh, working out differences on key issues, that's something that you wanted lawmakers to do before you call them back uh, to, for, for a special session. Will you share what some of those issues are right now that you want lawmakers to iron out before we get to a special? I know you would love for me to announce on your show right now what those items will be, but I will not do that. However, uh, as I think you may know, uh, there are two items that I've talked about. One is election integrity. The other is bail reform. Quickly, some people may not know what bail reform is. There are some counties in the state of Texas that are releasing on bail, sometimes personal rec recognizant bonds, people who are dangerous criminals, who either pose a threat or actually are a threat and harm others while they are out on bond. We, we need to protect public safety by having bail reform that does not release back on the streets very dangerous criminals. And so those are two items that I've already announced. There'll be more uh, that we will be announcing later. 
In terms of, of timeline, are, are, I know we're looking at a fall special session to tackle redistricting and some federal stimulus. Can you explain to me that your thought process on the timeline for addressing bail reform, election integrity, sure. possibly other issues? Sure. Wes, you have to stay tuned. All right. And in terms of the quantity of, spe of special sessions, do you have an idea as to how many we'll see? We'll, we'll announce it when it occurs. And uh, do you, is, is anything off the table at this point in terms of uh, bringing lawmakers back? Yeah, we're not putting anything on the table or off the table other than those items that I mentioned. Do you believe that social media censorship, taxpayer-funded lobbying, transgender athletes, do, do you believe those constitute an emergency worthy of a special session? Well, first, as, as I think you know, I support legislation on all of those topics, but I'm not going to be announcing now. Uh, any other items that will be on a potential special session. On the border crisis, uh, relating to your disaster declaration, if I understand this correctly, your declaration removes licenses from child care facilities that have federal contracts. Can you share why you think that will help the thousands of kids that will be impacted by that decision? Sure. For, let's be clear about what we did and what will happen to the kids. What we did is the, the federal government has co-opted the state government to be involved in that licensing process, which is commandeering uh, state employees, uh, which is a violation of the United States Constitution. So what the state of Texas is doing is we're saying that the federal government cannot commandeer our employees and tell us what to do. If, if the federal government has created a problem on the border that leads to migrant children being in the state, it's the federal government's responsibility to take care of those kids. You've seen that happen uh, in locations around the entire state of Texas, whether it be uh, in uh, convention centers in Dallas or centers in Carrizo Springs or uh, in Pecos or Midland, Texas. It's the federal government's responsibility. So these are locations where the federal government can take over. It's just the federal government cannot commandeer either the state or state employees to do their job. On guns, you mentioned permitless carry as something that, that, that happened this, this legislative session. Some Texans, particularly in the El Paso region, feel that there have been promises made that were not kept uh, as, it, as it relates to the deadly mass shootings in, in that community. What's your message to those Texans who feel betrayed? Well, if, if you look at, the, there were some bills uh, that were passed, I think one by Cesar Blanc, Senator Cesar Blanco, uh, that was one of the issues that arose out of that shooting. Uh, but listen, we, we're always working to do two things. One is to make sure that Texans have the liberties that are given to them by the United States Constitution, while also doing everything we can to keep our community safe. Quickly on, on primaries and, and future aspirations, you said you're not focused on the primaries right now, but how long can you avoid that? Uh, and, and as it relates to, to 2024, um, does, does the session, does the way that this session wrapped up uh, change your thought or give you any new thoughts about higher office? Sure. Well, well first, uh, one thing that is occupying my time right now is in part what's behind my desk right now, and that will continue. So my, my focus right now is finishing my business as governor for this session, uh, which will last all the way through June the 20th. I do expect after that time to turn my attention to my reelection race uh, for governor, and we'll start talking about it more at that time. But my sole focus electorally is on running for reelection as governor. We're in right here in the middle of that signed veto period, and, and I'm wondering what considerations you make uh, as you, you go through that process uh, to, to determine whether you're going to approve a law that's been sent to your desk? So we, we look at, is this a good law? Is it not a good law? Does it potentially conflict with some other goals that we are trying to achieve? Things like that. We, we look largely, is this good for our fellow Texans? Is it going to make our state better? 